Um, and we're extremely excited to welcome uh, Ido Schoenberg, uh, the, the CEO and founder uh, of uh, Amwell, which we used to call American Well, uh, an extremely successful company, a public company now uh, that was pioneering uh, the space of uh, telehealth and, and virtual health and really talking about change making. Wow, what a journey. And I know Ido for many, many, many years and I've, uh, I've been a friend and, and observed the and, and really amazing journey that we will unpack today. Uh, I want to uh, turn it to Anil uh, to, to welcome everybody and say a few words, both on Clubhouse and uh, on, uh, on, on the Stanford Learning uh, Platform. So if you can also unmute on Clubhouse, Anil, it will be great to hear you on both. Well, uh, thank you, Ron. And Ido, wonderful to have you. As Ron mentioned, this lecture series and the class associated with it is really about how do we innovate and scale flourishing, right? And I think in essence, your company exemplifies one of the essential pillars, the leveraging of technology to amplify impact and broaden impact. And so part of this lecture series and discussion is for us to get to know how do you see the world? as a leader in this space. As Ron mentioned, we define this time as being in 3D change, change that's perpetual, it's ongoing, not gonna let up, pervasive in many sectors at once and exponential. And it's also defined by this mega trend of convergence, complex technologies converging with themselves. Think the iPhone as the exemplar and well, well, well beyond that, right? But also technologies and humans converging. GPS is a perfect example. Think AR, VR later, neural lacing down the road, right? All of these pieces. These are making profound impacts and disruptions in our world today. I think we got into a time machine during COVID and saw the future. In some ways, we're not going back. In other ways, we'll regress to the mean for a little bit, but then the future will emerge yet again. And so this is an opportunity in the, the Luminaries and Changemakers series to pick your brain. How do you see the world? And also, who are you as a leader? And how has your leadership journey informed how you see the world and where are we headed? So thank you for being with us, Ido. And uh, Ron, I'll hand it back to you. And thank you so much, Anil. I, I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great to be here. And, uh, you know, I think that it's, uh, we'll start uh, immediately. But first and foremost, welcome, Ido. Great, great to have you here. How are you today? I'm great, Ron, and thank you, Anil, both of you for your kind words. It's really a pleasure to be here. Amazing, amazing. So, uh, you know, I had a great several conversation with Ido about his leadership journey and change making, and it was amazingly insightful. We assigned some readings to the students who are with us uh, today uh, about Ido's background and about the, the change and impact that he's making in the world. And, and really, I mean, you know, we have this framework of concentric circles, right? Like when we teach leadership, when we teach change making, everybody thinks, wow, we're going to start with the, like these big things that you're changing the world with and, you know, all these kind of like complicated notions. But we actually like starting at the core. We like starting in the innermost circle, right, of the concentric circles. And we want to start by really knowing you. Before we're talking about leadership, before we're talking about change making, before we're talking about changing the world, we want to understand you really, really well. And what drives you? What's your motivation? The why, right? So let's start uh, with what inspires you to lead and make change. Well, as you know, that's a tough question that deserves a really long answer, which I won't give, don't worry. Um, I think there are two things that matter when it's all said and done, and that's uh, uh, love and, and, and creativity. And love is not only the love of your spouse or your children, it's, it's, it's a greater love, the love of humankind and the ability to, to give. Uh, we are here for a really short uh, while, and if we can make a scratch to make the world a little bit a better place, that's honestly enormously uh, rewarding. And also intellectually, uh, there is fun in, in, in creating. There is fun of, of doing something that didn't exist before uh, that has a value. And when I, these are the two axes uh, that unfortunately sometimes conflict uh, that govern uh, my life because uh, we are all sometimes not balanced enough and spend too much time at work and little time with our family or vice versa, dedicate all our time to our family and sometimes feel frustrated that we could have done uh, more and impacted uh, more people. Amazing. 
Uh, so we're talking about the balance, a balancing act between uh, you know, these two very, very important things. And, and I wanna dig deeper into the, the core. What is the core and vision of possibility? The why, right? Like let's understand you deeper and why you're doing what you're doing. Well, um, healthcare is important, right? Healthcare is everything. Your loved one can be in good health and you're happy. And if something bad happens, that destroys your life in, in every way, sometimes virtually really kills you. So the mission is, is very simple. Uh, unfortunately, uh, healthcare is not uh, delivered democratically to every corner of the globe. There are huge gaps in care. If you're lucky enough to live in New York City, your care is very, very different from a village in uh, Africa today. And that's a concern. But even anywhere in the world, uh, we are nowhere near the efficiency that can be created by th rethinking the model of care. And care was divorced from technology. It's one of the last segments in the, in the, in, in the ecosystem that wasn't really improved uh, in a material way uh, since inception. And right now we are beginning to see the enormous opportunity to allow people uh, to live better lives, longer life, higher quality uh, life in a more equita equitable way. And that's, that's, a, that's a driver that drives me, that drives our team uh, in, uh, in Amwell. Amazing, thank you. I appreciate you for that. Very, very good understanding of the, of the core motivation, which is it's so important for leadership and understanding you as a person and, and what motivates you. And I want to go to the to your personal journey, talking about yourself. You know, and I, I want to take you back, right? Uh, I want to take you back to the journey of becoming a leader and change maker, right? So, you know, let's let's double click on these like turning points, you know, intersections, decision points, things that happened in your life that really shaped who you are today, shaped your motivation, shaped, you know, the, the way you're thinking about what you're doing today, and created for you the bedrock of making big change in the world? Sure. Um, I knew I became a businessman when I was about four years old. Uh, I was uh, going in my little village outside Jerusalem and saw a guy with a very large blind mule. He was trying to get rid of the mule and I purchased the mule for 25 cents which was what I had in my pocket and proudly brought the mule back to my home to the great distress of my parents. They ran out of the house frightened and say, what is this? And I said, that's, that's my property. I bought a mule. It's a little blind, but it looks great. They were so concerned about this prospect that I immediately was able to trade the mule back to the guy that sold it to me in a promise for two donkeys which I later received. And then I understood that negotiation is really, really important uh, in life. Uh, more seriously, uh, I was born in Israel and my entire army service was uh, in 1982, started in 1982, uh, where, where we had war in Lebanon. And uh, going out uh, and spending time in a combat zone is, is a shaping moment. Uh, you do change your, your ideas about what matters in life. Uh, the, the, the importance of friendship, the importance of truth, uh, the importance of culture and character uh, over uh, sometimes intellectual brilliance. Uh, it's, 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 it's something that if it wasn't so horrible, uh, I would recommend as, as, as a training exercise, but it was definitely a shaping uh, moment also in the sense that you can discover that you can be fine not sleeping four or five nights and you, you're okay. Uh, and, and there are limits to what you can do that are far uh, further away than what one can, uh, can uh, realize. Uh, I just want to meet, give maybe one other example to, to shaping events. Uh, when I started uh, uh, my, my number two company, I met a guy that later became uh, the chairman uh, of, of my company, and he passed away uh, not too long ago. His name is Sheldon Edelson. And he stayed the chairman of this company for, for two decades, uh, although it was really a small part of his portfolio. And he spent enormous amount of time teaching. And if there is something that is important is to, be, to teach and to be open to get taught. Uh, that level of humility is incredibly powerful for people understanding that no one is smart enough 
and you really, really need to interact uh, with other and look at the mirror and question yourself uh, as you as you go. Thank you, Ido. That uh, that's very, very helpful. And uh, yeah, constant learning is uh, an important part of our the framework that Anil and I created here uh, last year of sapient leadership uh, and the ability to to be humble and then continuously learn all the time. Uh, became a, a big important pillar that we heard from the, the best leaders that we, we interviewed. So appreciate, uh, appreciate that insight. And uh, wanted to also take you, uh, you know, to, to some of the most important lessons uh, you've learned in that vein, right? Like, and, and, and what did they, what, what did they, why were they so important to who you are today? If you can share a lesson or two, like more specific lessons that you learn over time with an example or two, that would be really helpful. Sure, uh, maybe one story that relates to perseverance. Lots of people have great ideas. It's very much about execution and it's uh, very much about uh, not giving up. And I'll give you, I'll tell you a story. So I shared with you uh, the end, the relationship with, with Sheldon Edelson, uh, God, rest, God rest his soul. And here's how it started. So he, we were looking for money like every young company and he came to, uh, to the Tel Aviv Medical Center to, to look at what we do. And we showed him uh, that we were able to collect enormous amount of data from different devices around the patient bed and then chart it and create smart alerts that were really helpful uh, to the team that took care of uh, people in an era where everything was done on very large manual flow sheets that were really very difficult uh, to decipher. So it made sense. And we were asking for $2 million. And he says, well, it's not my area. And I would like you to produce a film that I will take to the United States and show it to, to others. And if they like it, I'll, I'll, I'll come in. And we spent five days and about 20% of the budget that I asked for on film. Uh, they were the best directors, wonderful cameras, and so on and so forth. And uh, we shot the film. And we went to the tallest building in Tel Aviv at the top floor uh, where he waited to see the film. Uh, everybody was, was, was very quiet when he put the cassette, the beta cassette in the, in the machine, uh, looked at the film that was about 10 minutes long, didn't move a muscle in his face, turned to us and said, and I'm now being kind, this is terrible. I don't want to touch it. I'm not going to invest. That was quite a bummer after five years, five days of hard work. And we said, Mr. Erdson, what's wrong? And he says, well, it's flowery. And it looks like a commercial and I don't think it's authentic. And he said, well, if we had another movie, would you change your mind? He said, yeah, but I'm leaving tonight and it's too late. And we tried, thank you. I'm not sure that he even said thank you. And we were out the room very, very quickly climbing down the elevator in a very rainy day in Hanukkah uh, in December in Tel Aviv. Uh, literally outside the rain, uh, between our tears and the rain, there was very little hope at that moment in this very, very, very dark afternoon. So I turned to who is today my wife and said, we need to, we need to do something. And we called the guy that did the bar mitzvah shooting uh, uh, that we knew, and he said it doesn't have any guy with the lighting, he said, come with what you have. And we met at the Tel Aviv Medical Center, where I was the main actor, my wife was the director, I was also holding my own light, and we had time for one take. We did the one take, we run to the Israeli television to convert the Israeli format to a US format, and at 10.55, about 15 minutes before Sheldon Nelson was supposed to leave his home for his private plane back to the United States, we knocked on his door. Luckily, he opened the door himself. It was very clear that he had no idea who we are. So we reminded him that we are the people from before and we saw him earlier that day. He let us in, he was very polite. He put the cassette again in that machine, although this one, this time in his home, didn't move a muscle in his face, Turn around, shook our hand, and said, We're going to be partners. Now, I would never ever show this film to anyone 
It's pretty horrible. Sheldon Nelson did not invest because of the film. Sheldon Nelson invest because we didn't give up, because of perseverance, because we're ready to fight. And that's an important message to any young entrepreneur. You should get million no's. If you think that what you do is important, you should continue. Without being a, a unable to understand criticism, you need to all at the same time be very, very fair to yourself and to others. But very, very often, what you see is something that people fail to see because it didn't exist before. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you for the story and making it extremely vivid. Perseverance, uh, you know, being there, believing in what you're doing, being authentic, right? He, he gave a comment about authenticity versus being polished, right? So such, such important notions. Thank you so much for that, Ido. And, and, and I want to take you to, to this unprecedented, back to the, to the present, to these unprecedented times of COVID. I mean, this was a turning point for all of us, but a very, very important point for you and the company that you had founded well before that with a strong vision that was, was validated and became so important uh, in the, the early and the, 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 throughout the entire pandemic, the early days of the pandemic and throughout the entire pandemic. And I, I really wanna to, to ask you, you know, about, about these unprecedented time, change-making, leadership in this unprecedented time. And once again, how has what you've learned in the past informed you on how you lead now? Right? Like it's very, very interesting for me to, to, to hear what you're learning helped you be a better leader and a better change maker in this very unprecedented time of change. I think you touched on some of the key, uh, the key points. Uh, it's critically important to, to tell the truth to yourself, to your team, to your partners, to your investors, and so on and so forth. And it's less obvious than, it's, than it sounds. Sometimes, because of lots of good intention, we prettify things. We try to make them more beautiful uh, than they are. And we tell ourselves stories that we'd like uh, uh, to hear. So to be brutally honest and understanding change is important. The other point is not to fight change. So bad news is bad news. Stuff happens. What makes a difference is how you react to what happens and your understanding of the inability to, uh, to change that. Every crisis is an opportunity. These are obvious uh, things that happen to be truer today than, than ever, uh, than ever uh, before. I think that what we learn is that in order to make a change, there is a very long list of things that you need to do. Every problem is infinitely more complicated than it sounds at the beginning because there are many, many facets to something that will work. Uh, there were so many tablets before iPad, but iPad won because they finally figured out the true remaining uh, uh, barriers uh, in order to, to realize it. Very often what people discount is the psychological barriers. And if you think about COVID or any other crisis, it's first and foremost a psychological high anxiety situation. And people behave differently in those type of situations. And the inability to understand what drives people in way of positive motivation and fear is critical to any type of a business. It's true when you lead a team. It's true when people trust you with their money and their investments. It's true with your clients and uh, partners. Everybody is experiencing the same thing and you need to be empathetic. You really need to try to spend time and very actively try to look at the problem, not only from your own vantage point, but really on the other side, the vantage point. And again, it's not as uh, trivial uh, as it, uh, as it uh, sounds. Um, I think that uh, sometimes uh, when circumstances change dramatically, you learn a lot about the true nature of uh, people. Uh, so to give an example, we were incredibly inspired. We work with so many doctors and nurses and hospitals. These people are, 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 are amazing. Uh, they, they risk their own lives. They risk their lives of their families working day and night uh, without any real reason but to care for uh, people. And I think that is a very uh, optimistic takeaway for me because the human spirit won. We live in a time where there is enormous amount of cynicism. Uh, people are very self-centric in theory or at least superficially. And the good news is I don't think that goes deep. I mean, there is enormous amount of kindness of, 
of, of, of, of friendship, of ability to to uh, to uh, help people that is innate uh, in our uh, in our society. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. And again, inspiring and, and being tuned, uh, you know, to, to humans and their deep needs and their fears and concerns and uh, be tuned to that because, uh, you know, leadership is a lot about it. We always say that leadership is agency, right? We're, we're here for, for people, you know, for, for uh, improving their uh, welfare and to, to making sure that they're better off and how helpful they can be in the journey and being empathetic and listening and uh, feeling them, not just thinking about them, is, is is such an important thing. Thank you so much for for that, Ido. And uh, what? Give me some advice that you can give uh, to leaders that are leading in in this process of change, right? So, particularly on the leadership side, there are students here, uh, some uh, undergraduates, some graduate students. We have some people from faculty here. We have a a, a large number of people in Clubhouse that will join us. Uh, give us some uh, advice for leaders, right? Like how to lead during a time of change? So I don't profess to have the answers. I'm sure there are better leaders than I am and probably a few that are worse. Uh, I don't think there is a real uh, scale. The role of a leader is to provide clarity and focus to the group. Uh, you need to assume that there are people in your group that you lead that are smarter than you and lots of ideas. Uh, but the problem is that sometimes the group does not work as, 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 as one team. And creating one team with clear goals and clear mission and the ability to measure uh, that ability of a group to work as one body is the number one goal uh, of, a, of a leader. Uh, leadership is not an ego trip. Leadership is not a title. Leadership is by far a giant responsibility that weighs heavily on you because you're accountable. You're accountable for many things. First and foremost, for your team, they trust, they follow you. Uh, they are ready to accept your mistakes if you are ready to be transparent and uh, open. Uh, and the, the, the uh, derivative of that type of quality is really the culture uh, that you create. The best leader can retire and his spirit remains. You mentioned my friend uh, Toby Cosgrove earlier, who's also a board member uh, in Amwell, and that's a great example. Uh, he built an amazing institution, and as, as some of you may know, he retired, not that he really retired, but he basically moved on to do other things, but the amazing culture of Cleveland Clinic prevailed and is part of what the organization is because of in, his enormous uh, uh, infrastructure that he has uh, created uh, that focuses on not necessarily on the talent, but on the values. Uh, the values are, are, are critically important. Uh, and it's, it's really like a creature uh, that you don't always expect. Uh, I had uh, four companies in my, in my histories and each one of them was very, very different, although it has pretty much the same leadership. Uh, it's something that people uh, create, uh, create uh, together. Leadership does not mean that you're powerful or strong. It's fine to, to be transparent and open about vulnerabilities. It's fine to seek uh, help, but it's also very, very important to understand that you cannot protect yourself, shield yourself from taking decisions. You have to take decisions because there is one cockpit, there is one captain, and the ship needs to go somewhere. Uh, and otherwise, uh, you're not doing your job. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ido. Really appreciate that. And then just to, uh, to reset for just a second, we have another one quick section about the future, which we're all very excited about. We'd love to hear from you. And then we're going to go uh, for questions and answers with Anil. Uh, Dr. Anil Chima was with us uh, uh, on the stage here, both uh, you know, on the Stanford Remote Learning Platform and then also on Clubhouse. And uh, we, for those of you who just joined us, uh, you know, recently we're here with uh, Dr. Ido Schoenberg, uh, who's the founder and CEO of Amwell, a uh, very successful uh, virtual health, digital health, uh, telehealth company. It's a, a public company uh, that was instrumental in transforming healthcare from being uh, very analog to, to becoming uh, virtual and, and digital uh, over many years uh, of transformation. Uh, so thank you for joining us. If you're not following Ido, he just joined, literally just joined the, the platform. Uh, 
you know, for this uh, uh, for this particular interaction. So we're excited to have him in the class, Lead 111 at Stanford, but we're also excited that, that you joined us on Clubhouse uh, for Leadership Reinvented. You know, we have more than 80,000 people now in Leadership Reinvented and uh, we encourage everybody to uh, to join the, the club if you're interested to, uh, to uh, meet more amazing people like Ido and uh, continue this conversation where we learn uh, and get inspired uh, by uh, leaders and change makers, uh, luminaries like Ido uh, here that we have the privilege uh, to have with us uh, today. So thank you again, Ido, and let's talk about the future possibilities, right? So uh, how have these times inspired new ways of leading and change making in the future for you, Ido? So the future is going to be great. Uh, the only downside is that we're all going to get much older. Um, but apart from that, I'm very excited about things uh, to come. Uh, essentially, obviously, our uh, point of view relates to, to healthcare. And healthcare, in my opinion, is going to change in a very uh, profound uh, way. So people talk a lot about telehealth, and many people perceive telehealth as solving uh, one problem, which is distance. My doctor is not with me in my room, so I'm using Zoom or something else to connect with my doctor, and that's great. Uh, the only problem is that, well, there are many, many problems with that. When I'm sick, my doctor may not be available, and therefore for, for a really long time, uh, telehealth was really an alternative service in the cloud uh, to my doctor. It was a service, uh, and it was really utilized for a very limited part of healthcare. Uh, I have a pink eye, I have a sore throat, I sort of need a prescription maybe, so I'm going to go to some guy or girl that never met me to get this prescription filled and I'm going to feel better. Uh, that has some value, but it misses out on the overwhelming majority of cost and pain in healthcare. Most of the issues obviously are chronic issues that re require specialist care and things of that nature, and the platform didn't do anything. Uh, serious to, to help uh, uh, that uh, venue. In the first business plan of Amwell, 15, more than 15 years ago, we had a vision of a new model of care that goes well beyond video conferencing. What we said is that imagine a world where people are connected to technology all the time. And whether it's wearable devices or other source of data, there is enormous flow of information coming from our bodies all the time. And imagine that there are systems that are able to really make this information meaningful with great uh, uh, insights. And, um, and then once you understand what happened, think about a world where the best doctors in the world are rethinking care plans. Because when you treat diabetes, assuming that you see your patients once in six months and take the hemoglobin A1C, think again when you can connect to your patient all the time and see exactly what their glucose level is and how much insulin they took right now, today. Of course, you can do much, much uh, more. So you need to rethink the care plan. And then imagine a world... I'm sorry, my bad. And then imagine a world where you don't go to healthcare, but healthy comes to you. We seem to go to our doctor all the time and it's driven by pain. And imagine that your interaction in, in healthcare sometimes comes before you even feel your symptoms because the system detected something that is wrong about you and created a, an alert. And then imagine that you can still get service from people that you trust in a price that you can afford and get the intervention in a very personal way delivered back to your home. Your, your a genomic a appropriate drug is printed in a printed near you and sent by Amazon in a bag 20 minutes after the event has happened and you're able to take it and get advice from your home television from a, a pharmacist about whether to take this medication together with food and what could be the potential side effect. This is not science fiction. This is something that is being realized as, as we speak. So if you think about it, healthcare did not change for the last few thousand years, including the last decade of telehealth. 
we feel bad, we go to the cave, there is a line, we wait. If we're lucky, the guy in the cave help us. If not, we find another cave and start over. When we go online to seek a doctor, it's pretty much the same thing. What I just described is something completely different that allows to do many important things. Uh, the quality of care with this enorm enormous amount of data is much better. The ability to use algorithms from the best clinicians at Stanford, the Cleveland Clinic and others. And of course we did with Stanford University, the Apple Heart Study is, is a great example, uh, is extremely democratic because so many people can really experience the genius of those clinicians that otherwise would not be available uh, uh, to them. So you can save a ton of money, uh, you can improve care, and much more importantly, you can democratize uh, care. What does that mean to us? It really means that we can spend more time with our live loved ones, we can age gracefully uh, in our homes, uh, and it also opens the gate to, to innovators. Uh, lots of people that were, couldn't participate in improving healthcare are able to do it right now, not only by offering compassion and physical care on one-on-one, -on -one, but creating algorithms and ideas that truly save millions and millions of, of, uh, of people. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, as you know, I'm very, very passionate about this uh, topic as well and the, the way you're speaking about it today. And I, I, I have had the privilege to, to see you throughout the entire journey from the very, very, very early days of, uh, of Amwell, way back when in Boston, when we had the dinner to, to today. And, uh, you know, it's, it's beautiful to see, to see it evolving and it, see your vision uh, becoming a reality and still work in progress to, to get to, you know, it's always going to be work in progress. It's still more to do uh, forever, but really appreciate you and also all the amazing work that the, you and the Amul have done throughout the pandemic, uh, you know, to, to help people to save lives uh, and to be there when, when people need, needed it most. So what, what an inspiring story, uh, what an inspiring journey. Uh, really appreciate you for that, Ido. And, and I'm also extremely excited about the next part because there are so many jewels in this interview and, and they're related to the research that Daniel and I have done, the, the work that we published together uh, you know, at the Harvard Business Review with Sapient Leadership and the framework that we created. So I'll hand it off to, to Anil. Uh, I just wanted to say particularly uh, on Clubhouse, but also people that join us uh, on the Zoom, uh, please, uh, of course, Ido is the CEO of a public company. Uh, they're obviously, uh, this is an educational conversation and it needs to stay as such. It needs to stay around the, uh, along the lines of uh, education. And uh, uh, we're here to really benefit, uh, in the, first and foremost, the students and the the people that are in the class and definitely our community uh, as well uh, and in, on Clubhouse on the Leadership Reinvented, but please keep the uh, questions and, and conversation around things that are related to leadership and change making. And let's leave the things that are related to managing public companies to other forums. So thank you very much for that. I appreciate you for that. Uh, it's all yours, Anil. So Ido, this is fascinating. The vision that you paint of the future of healthcare of how I am well and I hopefully live long with a long health span is really compelling. Um, and, and some would say uh, also opens up things that are scary, <laughs> right? And, and questions of privacy and digital health records and, 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 and privacy as a right also opens up a massive horizons of possibilities. I've, I've got a cluster of questions around that and I'm gonna synthesize them. And so one way uh, of asking this would be, so what gets us from where we are now, which you said we already have the seeds here of that future, of that emerging future now, what really amplifies and accelerates and, and, and creates, you know, uh, 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 um, the effect across many sectors that you're talking about, right, and, and gets us to that emerging of future vision. What are the most important levers we need to look at? What are the ways in which we have to re-envision systems? You know, obviously, huge tech players are getting into the health, uh, health uh, uh, um, area. We talked about that last year in our last series. Uh, you know, Walmart, for example, is re-envisioning its brick and mortar to be a healthcare conduit as well as merging into the virtual space. 
same with Apple, Amazon, all these, you know, Google and so on. So what has to shift for that emerging future to come to its fullness? We had a few different questions sort of, I think it all synthesizes that. It's a, it's a great question and, or maybe series of uh, questions. What's very apparent to me is that this is a, an enormous effort and no company, not even Google or Amazon or, or Microsoft or, or, or Cerner uh, could do that themselves by themselves alone. It takes a village. And in order to realize the vision that I painted, one needs to not go broad, but rather go narrow, which is counterintuitive. Many companies say, I'm going to do it all. I'm going to collect the data, to analyze it, to create care plans, to engage the consumer, to connect, to offer delivery, to offer insurance, coverage, actuaries, and so on and so forth. We see a lot of cross-pollinations, providers trying to be payers, payers trying to be providers, and tech companies uh, stepping up and professing to offer you care. We talked a lot about psychology, but there is a DNA to a contributor. There is a true nature, true colors of every organization and what they bring to the table. You cannot really beat the ability of Google to analyze the information and to, 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 to organize it. You cannot beat the buying experience on Amazon. Uh, you, it's very hard to create EMRs like Epic and Cerner uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. And when you're sick, you really want to talk to your doctor. You don't want to talk to anyone else. You want to go to the hospital in your community that you know and trust, the Academical Medical Center in Stanford. Uh, and we have a great relationship with that uh, institution uh, uh, because you trust them. So the challenge in many ways is twofold. One is, how do you physically allow all those entities to collaborate? That's much harder than it sounds. And that's the role that Amul is trying to take. We are plumbers, we are connectors. We are not the device manufacturers. We don't do the analytics. We don't create the care plans. We're not the provider. We're not the payer. Uh, we're not many things. But our reason of living is just to make sure that when and if those players want to interact, we are there for them. The ability to interact should not be confused with will to interact. Many organizations are protecting their turf, are very, very competitive and so on, and are very concerned about opening up. So the most important uh, element that would fuel or uh, uh, decelerate uh, our ability to reach this, this wonderful future is leadership, is the courage of leaders to define what is the exact contribution of their organization to this story, and then not do anything else and open up so you can really share your capabilities uh, with others. And without naming names, I'm talking to the top leaders in every segment of the ecosystem that I described, and that is the conversation. Who are you? What do you bring to the table? And how are you planning to interact with others so your contribution is much more uh, meaningful? I could imagine that is quite a Herculean effort, but absolutely necessary in the way to align interests and get common purpose surfaced. Uh, that talk about a mega challenge. This. If you can solve this, Ido, please share that wisdom widely, because I could imagine such an approach is necessary for all the grand challenges that face our, our world today. Healthcare being one, climate change being another, and so on. You know. Well, don't, 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 don't really start about climate change. Obviously, I have strong feelings about that uh, mm -hmm. as well. But going uh, back to, to healthcare, the main reason I'm optimistic is that there is, a, there is huge necessity. It's very clear to everybody, including governments, that we cannot continue to, to work this way. It's enormously inefficient. We cannot finance it uh, anymore. Uh, and there is, a, there is a better way to do that. One of the silver lining of the terrible year plus that we all had is that necessity uh, forced innovation. And necessity forced people to accept and discover things that they were mentally not ready to discover. 
a very simple example are the readiness of, of grandmas and grandfathers to talk to the doctor online. It's harder than it sounds. We tried to do that for 15 years and didn't really work. But when people are locked in their home, they do that. Equally hard is the readiness of doctors to connect with their patients online. That was very, very tough. They weren't ready uh, to do that, but necessity created a way for them to reimagine a uh, connectivity and interaction uh, in a new way that now paves the way uh, for the change that is, uh, is uh, truly, uh, truly necessary. So there's some, I think you're sparking a lot of questions here, Ido. There are a couple more here. I know we've got some folks on, on Clubhouse as well. Um, I'm gonna voice one of the questions coming from Camille Khan. He was a Distinguished Career Institute Fellow at Stanford a couple of years ago, wonderful human. Uh, Camille, I'll read your question to Ido. Um, you know, when, when he was at Stanford, it really surprised him that Stanford and Palo Alto, that there was the best health care you could get, right? But across the bridge in East Palo Alto, there was some of the worst or some real challenge aspects. And so this is, how can we get everyone to share the best health care? He lives in the UK. Here we have the best health care for all. I know this is a big question, but I'd love to hear your view. So um, I think my essence, the essence of it is, you know, equity and getting provide maximizing quality of healthcare for all. And um, how do you see that, particularly in this evolution uh, into digital health as you're talking about? So uh, Camille, that, that's a great question and something we are very, very passionate about. I mean, if anything, democratization of healthcare, bringing great care to many more people is the mission uh, of, uh, of uh, Amwell. So it really starts with the race to space. Uh, no, no, not that space, the space between the meetings. So today healthcare is conducted in, in a session, in a meeting. And most of our time, we do not spend time with our doctor if we are lucky enough to see the right uh, uh, provider. Realizing that technology can be present in our lives say, all the time to collect information, to guide, uh, to nudge, to educate and then connect us with other people is enormously uh, powerful. And we're just beginning uh, to realize some of uh, the potential. Uh, when we look uh, further into the future, uh, I think that the role of a provider will change dramatically. Uh, on the one hand, you'll have the geniuses of Stanford that will sit in, in campuses that more look much more like a campus of Google than Apple and much less like a hospital. And they're going to think, and they're going to innovate, and they're going to come up with algorithms like the one that they use in the Apple Heart, the heart Study. But on the other hand, when someone hears bad news, I really don't want to get it from a bot somewhere. I want to have an empathetic nurse or a doctor put a hand on my shoulder and, and have a human discussion. So empathy and human interaction will not go away. A hybrid is here for sure but everything in the middle will be automated. Using lots of technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning and natural language processing and many, many other tools that are going to be able to basically amplify the best care uh, possible. Think about digital therapeutics in the same way that you think about the drug. You create the solution and then there are challenges to disseminate it. And that's a, a very happy thought uh, in many ways, because the energy of care, the resources of care uh, can be infinitely more uh, focused. The greatest source of inefficiency in healthcare today is fragmentation. We get to do things too often, too many times by the wrong people that cost way too much. Uh, by virtualizing the services, we have the opportunity to appropriate care, to make sure that people get what they need from the right resources. Very often those resources are automated, but sometimes they are, they are a, a human. A, and that's, by the way, a global opportunity, not only a US opportunity. Bridging the resources and the recipients of those resources in a very smart way is a global challenge that is true a, anywhere. I can give an example. I'm talking for, to you, with you now from, from Israel, where 1.2 million Israelis are connected to a national network of providers in Israel through our platform. 
and our platform is made in Boston. But it was still very, very helpful, especially during the pandemic, to bridge connectivity between those two uh, cohorts. So I want to say, you know, your way of conceptualizing these, conceptualizing the middle, Edo, you know, is fascinating. Camille, thank you for that. Uh, as always, excellent and, and insightful question, is essential question. Let me take one more question here from, from the Stanford crew, and then we'll hop over to the, the Clubhouse crew, Ron. Uh, so Ido, this is coming from uh, Prashant Yadav, who is a MSX Sloan Fellow at the uh, Business School, a change maker in his own right, uh, who's, who's working on a project at the Stanford Children's Hospital on continuous uh, uh, real-time glucose monitoring for diabetic kids. Uh, and and uh, he's, uh, I think, really resonating with much of what you're saying. His question is, how do you see, and I think you alluded to this, but I think he's wanting to go a little deeper here. How do you see telehealth or digital health companies evolving, especially because tele-digital health companies are not the providers or payer of health service? You alluded to this and just mentioned it. Do you only see telehealth or digital health companies working as conduits between all other players, providers, payers, and so on? Or do you envision something different, a different kind of ecosystem? I think you just talked about it. So, you know, if you want to amplify a little bit more on what that new ecosystem will look like, um, and then we'll hop over to some of the folks on Clubhouse, Ron. So thanks for the question, Prashant. Ido, please. So Prashant, A. Thank you for what you're doing. It sounds enormously uh, important, and I hope we'll have an opportunity to, to leverage what we're doing across uh, our uh, ecosystem uh, as well. Enablement is not a binary thing. Enablement... So I think you might be on mute on the club. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect, perfect. OK. Um, so I'll just repeat. Um, so first, I want to thank Prashant for, for what you're doing. It sounds enormously uh, important. And I hope that we'll have an opportunity to, to take some of the stuff that you're creating and make it available to uh, many more uh, people. Enablement is not binary. It's not uh, enabling a session or video conference. Essentially, it's creating the pipes for information and services so people that have something new to add to improve healthcare, to more efficient care, can do that in the most uh, uh, simple and uh, easy way. Uh, there are two challenges. Uh, one is technology, and the other one is the uh, business challenge of working with different players. Uh, technology is, is, is really simple. It took us a decade and a half to develop APIs to check your eligibility, to submit a claim, to integrate into an EMR, or things of that nature. Imagine that you invented a little ultrasound, which is a true example, that costs 30 bucks. That's pretty amazing, right? A pregnant woman can put it on her belly and broadcast the, 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 the baby, the embryo to her OBGYN. Uh, and that could be very helpful uh, to many people. But for a company like that, to make this ultrasound a covered benefit, to find an OBGYN that is able to look at it, to embed the video inside the electronic medical record, to collect a copayment, to submit a claim, to do that in a HIPAA compliant way with great emphasis on privacy and cybersecurity, and long list of many other things is going to make it extremely unlikely for this company to build all this technology just to sell this uh, component. Making things worse, in order to make this available, you need to get it covered. You need to go through the long and, and very expensive process of working with different health insurance companies to prove the value and the viability of your uh, product. Our role is to shorten that uh, uh, process uh, very significantly. Last week, we had our annual client forum in uh, Amway, and we announced our next generation platform called Converge. I, I won't talk about it too much or in too many details, but I want to point out one feature of Converge that I'm really proud of. And that is that for the first time in our history, we took our platform and opened it up to the public. Uh, so it's, it's now a, 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 an operating system that allows you to write applications and programs by third parties. So Prashant, imagine that your glucometer, your, your real-time real continuous glucometer could be integrated into every Cerner hospital in the United States and 25% of the hospitals in the United States are Cerner hospitals. 
Imagine that 40 million people in Anthem could benefit from your creation and it takes you three weeks to write the interface because all the APIs are there and there is a fast track to make it uh, covered. That's the example of the role of, a, a, of connectivity a, that we bring to the table. It's very apparent to all of us, I'm sure at this point, that the world telehealth will disappear. It will be healthcare. And healthcare will leverage technology a, to create a fascinating new ways of connectivity between partners that normally don't connect today. So I think here's a follow on question coming from from Clubhouse uh, and someone pinged it through via text. And, and the question is, is related, I think, to te the technology side of it, right? What are the technologies in the, and I love how you said it's no longer going to be telehealth or digital health, it's just going to be health care, right? What are the types of technologies that are emerging? This is the question here. What are, what are the types of technologies that are emerging in, in a variety of ways, diagnostic, communication, you know, assessment, that you are most excited about that you think are the most game-changing for the space? And there's an add-on, which is what are the type of technologies you really hope could be invented <laughs> or need to be invented where there are gaps? The most exciting thing is the thing that you don't see. And that's the enablement of uh, connectivity. Because one thing for sure, there are endless innovations coming our way. But in most cases, they take too long to get to us. Uh, when we enable an infrastructure that we let people reach the market much sooner and collaborate in a much uh, better way, we are bound to find uh, amazing uh, uh, technologies that will make an impact. So I'll give you an example. Again, from our client forum, uh, we had the pleasure of hosting the CEO of Google Cloud, uh, Thomas Kurian. And Google has a big toy store of innovation that had hard time finding itself to, to healthcare because healthcare is conservative and it's very regulated and so on and so forth. But with us as pipes, we could do some pretty amazing things. So I'll give you a, an example. The first apps on Amwell are made by Google. And the first apps that we decided to embed in Google talk, talk uh, uh, for democratization. Uh, and they include real-time medical grade transcription and translation. So I can basically continue this conversation in Hebrew right now talking about my pe peptic ulcer and you as my doctor are going to understand every word I'm saying without an interpreter with very high accuracy. Using natural language processing with the permission of the patient, we can listen into the conversation, pick up some keywords and allow the doctor to prescribe a short video to curate patient education after the visit to make sure that the patient really understood what we just uh, uh, talked uh, about. The point I'm making is not about the importance of translation or natural language processing or artificial intelligence. The point I'm making is that it's, we just created the giant canvas for people to paint and they can bring their ideas and it costs them a fraction of what it cost them before and they can test it much faster than they did before in order to bring great care uh, to the ecosystem. And mind you, it, it allows them, and I'll use a Google acronym, to fail fast forward. To the cost of failing is, is, is much less. And that should motivate people to try more things uh, to create much, much richer uh, uh, environment. Amazing. So Thank I, you. Yeah, I just wanted to, Say we want to be respectful of the hour that we've set aside. I know there are a lot more questions here uh, to be had. We could have another hour just of the Q&A. But Ido, really want to thank you for your time and give you the last word. Uh, Ron and I like to ask a, a slightly different question here, which is, you know, you are a global leader and change maker. You're helping shift key levers in the world. 
we often say that, yes, we want to innovate on the technology side. We want to innovate in all these areas. And we also really want to innovate on the leadership and human side. If you were to give your parting advice, sort of distill it down into your essential advice to leaders and change makers who are trying to make positive change at scale, what should they really pay attention to? I think you mentioned and alluded to this earlier, but what's your parting sort of distilled essential advice for these leaders who are looking to make you know, change for the good at scale? Well, uh, that's a tough question. Uh, I would uh, maybe think about someone I learned a lot from uh, I was sitting um, on the terrace of his son, looking at the Golan Heights, and he, I told him about Amwell, and he turned to me and said, I'm very disappointed. And that's an unusual reply, uh, because I was quite proud about what we were doing. And I said, why are you disappointed? And he said, we're sitting here, and you never once there is a civil war going on in Syria about you know, 50 miles from where we sit, and you never once told me how your platform helps uh, uh, other uh, people. Um, I think that uh, leaders uh, need to be truthful. Uh, by the way, this guy was, was the president of Israel, Shimon Teres, uh, who wrote an amazing uh, book uh, called No Room for Small Dreams. And that relates to, to your question uh, in a number of ways. Uh, number one, heart is much more important than brains. Uh, you need to be empathetic and you need to be human and you need to be truthful. Uh, and the second thing is life is way too short for small dreams. Big dreams are easier to implement than small dreams because you have lots of people joining. If you think small, usually the risk is much higher of getting little impact. So dare to dream and then be incredibly uh, 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 passionate about the small details and the small stops that will get you and others uh, to get there. Uh, be uh, very modest about your own contribution and respect and appreciate others because others will make your dream come true. It's never yourself. Amazing. Thank you, thank you, Ido. That was... Uh... That was beautiful and inspiring in so many ways and, and, and extremely applicable because you'd be surprised, you, know, you don't know that, but the, the guest that we have next week, who's another luminary and change maker you probably know, uh, is actually the new leader of the Labour Party in Israel, Shimon Peres, the Nobel laureate, Shimon Peres, whom I had the huge privilege to meet in the past and it obviously passed away. Uh, you know, was the once once the leader of the Labour Party in, in Israel and the the new leader of the Labour Party, Mirav Mikhaeli, is actually joining us uh, next week uh, for Lead 111 and uh, leadership uh, and change making. Uh, and uh, so another fascinating conversation. So what an amazing uh, connection and uh, a great uh, way to, uh, to, say, to, to learn from, from inspiring people that really changed the world uh, you know, for, in such a profound way, like uh, Nobel Peace Prize uh, laureate uh, Shimon Peres and, and your inspiring words uh, you know, to the world about what matters, about the matters of the heart and for dreaming big. So uh, I really appreciate you for that, for an amazing conversation. Uh, we loved every minute of it. We learned a lot, we got inspired. I wanna say thank you for your time. Thank you for taking this call. And uh, we're looking forward to continuing the conversation and to continue to seeing you continue to succeed in everything that you're doing in the future. Thank you so much, Ido. That was a true treat and a pleasure. Thank you, Ido, very much. Good morning, Anil. Uh, my, my great pleasure. Uh, thank you, everyone. I didn't see your faces, but I really hope to meet you uh, in person. Uh, there is a lot to do, and, uh, and it's going to be great. Never give up.